it seems that we have the same kind of issue as we have in Israel between the defense minister and Netanyahu and in Ukraine between Zelensky and Sersky. Do we know if Sersky was agreeing with the concept of offensive on the Kursk region? Well, I mean, again, when you say do we know, that implies absolute knowledge. And uh, I don't have it. Um, I don't think you have it. I don't think anybody has it. Um, what we do, what we can ascertain is that there has been some stress between the office of the presidency and Sirsky on where to place priorities. Um, as was the case with Zeluzhny prior, the, the, the man who commanded Ukrainian grand, um, army prior, Zelensky is very concerned about the politics of this conflict in terms of keeping the, uh, the money flowing into Ukraine, keeping the weapons flowing into Ukraine. And so he oftentimes seems to be looking for military operations uh, that promote the theory as opposed to the reality of Ukraine, the, the, the um, viability of Ukraine's continued resistance, et cetera. Uh, and so this is why you got the battle for Bakhmut. This is why you got um, the 2023 counteroffensive. This is why we got the battle of Advievka. And this is why we got Kursk. Uh, Zelensky's looking for the gesture. But every single one of those battles that I described, including Kursk, resulted in a strategic a, a debacle for the Ukrainians, an absolute debacle. Um, and Kursk will end up being a debacle for Ukraine as well. Sirsky is trying to stabilize the, the front. He is uh, desperately trying to come up with a, um, a military solution to the problem of Russian dominance. Uh, right now, Russia... You know, is winning the war of attrition. Ukraine is exhausted by this. They can't rotate in new troops. There are no new troops to rotate in. And Sersky was, I believe, hoping to um, to build up the strategic reserve so that it could be brought down to, um, to stabilize uh, the front. Um, there was rumors that, Russia, that Ukraine was going to be um, launching some sort of major offensive in the Zaporizhia area using these resources. But um, I don't think Zelensky was thrilled about repeating 2023 and 2024, meaning sending down your best units and then running up against your, uh, Russian defenses that would slaughter you. Um, and so they made a, a decision. Uh, Zelensky talked with advisors and they came up with a, um, an action that, uh, you know, was predicated on seizing a nuclear power plant, the cursed nuclear power plant that could be then used to uh, exchange for the Zaporizhia nuclear power plant. Uh, an important uh, Zelensky goal was to be seen as taking back uh, critical territory from Russia, uh, seizing Kursk and using whatever territory Ukraine could capture in Kursk, uh, again, as leverage to get at least some U uh, Ukrainian uh, territory that Russia has annexed to get it returned. Um, and lastly, to put Russia in a very uh, difficult a military position where they would have to divert resources away from the Donetsk fighting where Russia is on a roll right now, Ukrainians are collapsing, uh, to divert resources away from that to deal with the curse problem, um, thereby you know salvaging a very bad position the Ukrainians have in, in, in the Donbass. Uh, that didn't work either. Um, Russia has not diverted meaningful resources. Um, I, I think Sirsky knew that this Kursk operation wouldn't go well, but he has to obey the orders. That's what civilian control of the military is. And now he's paying a heavy price because as we speak, the Russians are you know, very close to some major breakthroughs uh, that'll lead to their occupation of uh, critical uh, terrain features, towns, villages, small cities, etc., that will um, make it impossible for Ukraine to maintain its position in the Donbass. And there are many people now talking openly about uh, the Ukrainians having to be compelled in, in the coming weeks to withdraw to the um, west bank of the Dnieper River because they're not able to maintain their defenses on the west bank. Can we speculate on the number of forces that Ukrainians have used for this offensive? 12,000, 14,000, something like this? Um, I think the Russians have said that uh, up to uh, units from... 
I think it's 18 different units, brigades, battalions, regiments, um, et cetera, were involved in this. And now we know that the Ukrainians have pulled uh, a couple brigades out of the um, Kherson and Zaporizhia area to come up and reinforce. They pulled some units out of the Kharkov front to reinforce. And so I think, you know, now we, we you know, you're looking at, I, you know, somewhere between 10 and 20,000 troops being committed to this, but not necessarily in Kursk. In Kursk, the belief is that the the maximum number of troops that penetrated were around 10,000. And today they've suffered around 6,000 casualties, uh, which means they have 4,000 left. They're trying to get reinforcements in, um, but these brigades that are brought in aren't getting out of the train station oftentimes before the Russians hit them. Uh, they're being destroyed in their in their assembly areas, um, equipment. And so in the, what we'll call the Sumi direction, the Sumi cursed direction, there may be, you know, between 20 and 30,000 Ukrainian troops, but they're not able to maneuver into uh, the zone because of Russian air power, artillery interdiction, and ground forces now that are increasingly taking control of the battlefield. Um, so I, 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 I think the the number of people who actually crossed into the border was around 10,000, um, you know, plus or minus a few. And the majority of those have become casualties. And IAEA chief Grossi is talking about the risk of nuclear incident in the Kursk region. What's the problem there in your opinion? In your opinion? What, what's the risk he's talking about? Yeah, IAEA chief Gross is talking about there is risk of nuclear incident in the Kursk region. Kursk and is an the, the Kursk nuclear power plant is an active nuclear power plant. Unlike the Zaporizhia plant, which has been cooled down, um, if you attack Kursk, if you strike, uh, you know, safety infrastructure, you could potentially create. Um, you know, the potential for a Chernobyl type meltdown, which would be catastrophic. So that's what he's talking about. Um, the Russians, though, have the, the, the plant very well protected. But, uh, you know, if he's going to make that statement, though, then he has to say that the, uh, the reason why there's going to be this potential is because of Ukraine and exclusively Ukraine. And he can't say that. He can't acknowledge that it's Ukraine's fault. He's just speaking of a you know, of the conditions that exist that could lead to the potential of this. And this is part of the strategy of the IAEA and the Europeans in general to um, to create the notion of an emergency that uh, requires European intervention to uh, achieve stability. Um, but it's a narrative that's falling on deaf ears inside Russia. Um, Russia's just not going to <laughs> allow, <laughs> allow what? Uh, Europe to come in to protect uh, the cursed nuclear power plant. What Russia is going to insist on is that Europe tell um, Ukraine to leave Kursk and to surrender, um, that the war is over, that it can't be won. Um, but yeah, that, I think that's it. And we had Modi's visit to Kiev, and he was talking about the negotiations and peace talks. And Today, we've learned that he was talking with Putin as well. Do we know what India is trying to do? And he is trying to be re relevant in the world stage. It's a, it's a major player. Um, it has some leverage in this conflict because of uh, BRICS. Um, Russia has a long uh, history of relations with India, and so uh, India you know, operates an independent foreign policy. And so one of the things India would like to do is bring about stability, uh, regional and global stability by bringing it into this conflict. So of course, India comes in with, uh, you know, a peace, you know, the concept of a, the potential of a peace plan. Um, and Russia has always said that it will not close the door on any legitimate um, discussion about peace. Um, but <laughs> the door is shut. Uh, you know, um, Modi did visit Kiev, but, um, you know, Ukraine invaded Kursk and that changed the entire outcome. Uh, Russia's just not in the, the mood, but Russia's not going to slam the door on Modi. Putin will listen to anything anybody has to say, but then Putin will 
you know, inform them of the realities and that if the peace plan doesn't deal with the realities, um, then there is no peace plan. How do you, because the head of Russian intelligence talking about that there is no possibility of having any sort of peace talks with Kiev. And with this attack, do you think that if you remember those preconditions of Putin before the summit in Switzerland, do you think Russia is achieving those preconditions without having any sort of negotiations? Absolutely. Demilitarization is taking place as we speak. The Ukrainians are uh, suffering horrific casualties, not only in Kursk, but in the Donbass. They're running out of troops. They're running out of equipment. That is literally the definition of demilitarization. Um, and I think now Russia has made strategic decisions um, regarding how this conflict ends and what Ukraine looks like when this conflict ends. And I, I think that the probability of Russia insisting that Odessa become Russia, Mykolaiv becomes Russia, Nepa Petros becomes Russia, Kharkov becomes Russia, and now Sumy becomes Russia. These are real probabilities um, that will forever change the map of Ukraine and, you know, the, the relevance of Ukraine going forward. Um, this is the direction we're heading. Now, the day of uh, sitting down and coming up with a, a modification of the Istanbul communique of uh, April uh, 2022, which is what Putin's plan was um, in June, those days are finished. Uh, Russia is not going to ever do that. Um, when this war ends, um, Ukraine will be demilitarized. Or Ukraine will be denazified. It will be the end of the Banderist movement, uh, the end of the uh, you know, ultra-Ukrainian nationalist uh, movements. Um, and Ukraine will be neutral. There won't be any NATO forces uh, in Ukraine, and Ukraine will not be entertaining the possibility of joining NATO. I think these are the three things that Putin insists on, and I think these are the realities now that Ukraine has to uh, adapt to if they want to bring this war to a, an end any other way than unconditional surrender. Well, Zelensky says he's not ready to talk about these things, these changes that are happening. And uh, I wonder when he's going to be ready to talk because Ukraine is losing more and more. I mean, at some point in time, people just going to have to turn him off. And I think that's the direction people are heading. Um, nobody cares what he thinks anymore. He's become irrelevant. He he can't you know, move the, the needle anymore on the geopolitical stage. Uh, he isn't the Winston, Winston Churchill. He's just a joke. He's a failed comedian. Everybody recognizes this. Um, he's a man who 100% supports his masters. I mean, if you think about the the insanity of what you know what he's doing now uh, presenting the united states with a list of targets that he wants the united states to approve so that he can strike uh, russia is part of a larger plan for victory uh, that uh, includes curse includes the invasion of of russia by ukraine and um it requires the united states to dramatically uh, change i mean this this man lives in fantasy land. This man is insane uh, and his insanity is going to um, sadly result in the, uh, in the destruction of Ukraine. There are many Russians right now who have said that um, the goal of Russia now is to fix, fix the error of, you know, Lenin. Um, and you say, well, what error is that? Well, again, refer to Putin's speeches in the past where he said that Ukraine exists only because Lenin made a mistake in creating it. And so now the way to fix the Ukraine problem is to fix that mistake. The implication is that there will be no Ukraine when this conflict is over. And I think that that's a more likely outcome than anything Zelensky's getting ready to you know, put on the table. We have two options in the United States right now. One would be the Kamala Harris Democratic Party that we know what would be their policy in Ukraine, it, could, it would be the same kind of policy as the Biden administration. But when it comes to the Trump and his mindset, recently J.D. Vance had an interview with Bill O'Reilly. He said that Europeans should 
focus on Ukraine, but the while the United States priority is China, do they really think that Europe alone can help Ukraine continue in this conflict with Russia while while they're focusing on China and maybe new sort of escalations between the United States and China? I don't know. Um, what I do know is this, that if Harris wins, she is going to have to put together a completely new foreign policy and national security team. Tony Blinken will not be part of this. Anthony Sullivan will not be part of this. Um, Jake Sullivan, uh, nobody will be. Uh, they're bringing in completely new um, thinkers. And why is this important? Because when she's sworn in, uh, these people are going to be dealing, understand that the reality that we see today during this campaign season, uh, where you have candidates responding to breaking news, is not the reality that will be in existence in January when uh, President Harris could be sworn in. Um, it'll be a completely different reality that her new people are going to have to deal with. Um, you know, it's one thing to sit here and, and articulate, um, you know, crowd pleasing rhetoric, um, you know, back Ukraine, stand up to Russia. It's, you know, it's another thing to be sitting at the White House with Europe saying we're done. Germany saying I'm, we're, we're broke. We can't do anymore. France going through a political crisis. Who knows if Macron will even be the president then? Um, England collapsing under a wave of new taxes and the social unrest. Europe is literally disintegrating before our eyes, literally disintegrating before our eyes, uh, the immigration crisis, et cetera. Um, and so all of these expectations about, you know, what, what Europe can and can't do, um, come January, it's going to complete, Ukraine is going to be complete. You know, Russia is taking out energy infrastructure right now. Um, Ukraine will not come out of this winter alive. It'll be the end of the Ukrainian state. So all this bold rhetoric is meaningless, meaningless, because there's a new reality that they're going to have to deal with in January. And, um, and that reality is going to include a strengthened and emboldened Russia. Um, so I, 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 I just disregard anything that is said um, by either the Harris or the Trump camps. J.D. Vance is going to be a vice president who is as irrelevant as, as you know, this bottle cap. Um, Donald Trump doesn't, doesn't listen, doesn't take advice. Uh, J.D. Vance isn't going to be able to knock on the door and say, hey, boss. Let's talk. First of all, J.D. Vance is dumber than dirt about foreign policy. He may have some basic instincts uh, to do this or do that. He knows nothing about Ukraine. It's obvious in everything he says about Ukraine. He knows nothing about Europe. There's nothing in his background that lends itself to this man being a foreign policy or national security genius. He just has some gut instincts. You know, America doesn't get involved in other people's war. Okay, I get that. But he's also a guy, you know, that 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 does the Trump thing, you know, flexes his muscles and all that. Whatever J.D. Vance knows or doesn't know, says or doesn't say, as I said, come January, it's going to be irrelevant because there's a new reality in town. And Donald Trump's going to have to deal with that reality, that reality. And, um, and we don't know how he's going to deal with it because we can't pit, paint that. But... I, I think right now in this this political season, this this silly season, you know, what I what I'm looking more for is not the specifics of how they're going to stand up to Russia. What I'd like to hear is how they're going to keep America out of a war. That's what I want to hear from a leader. How how are they going to prevent a nuclear war with Russia, with China? Um, how are they going to bring about an end to this conflict? It's not about Ukraine winning. The conflict will end with Ukraine's defeat. How do you manage that defeat so it mitigates against ongoing, um, you know, negative consequences? How do we restore Europe? Um, you know, are we going to need to open up the uh, spigots of cheap Russian gas to come back to Europe to to allow Europe to rejuvenate because expensive American LNG isn't the option? Um, can the United States? How, how how do we handle what could be? the collapse of NATO, the collapse of the European Union. What is our plan? How do we do this in a way that we don't lose Europe in the process? These are the discussions that need to be had 
uh, instead of talking about how some America is going to somehow retain its role as a global militaristic leader who is going to flex its muscles and people are going to poop their pants. That's that's fantasy. That's never going to happen again. Do we see unity in the European Union right now? Because even the, in the Western part of Europe, you see the Czech president saying that the Nord Stream pipeline was a legitimate target. And right after that, the German government said, no, that wasn't the case. That wasn't, you cannot say that. Do you, how do you see the difference between Olaf Scholz and Macron? The, the, the differences between the Western part and the Eastern part of Europe. How do you see, be, without the pressure coming from the United States, is Europe willing to continue this conflict in Ukraine or not? Well, it doesn't matter if they're willing to. They don't have the ability to. So they're, 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 the, the, the question's already been answered. I mean, Germany, you know, you got your great German generals. <laughs> concept that doesn't exist today. Um, but you know, these these bold leaders who have uh, led massive armies into great success around the world, no, they haven't. Um, talking about, we need to retool and reconfigure to be ready to fight Russia in five years. Okay, with what? You just tried to pass a defense budget. You didn't get what you want. Um, you only got, you know, I think 1.2 billion euro increase in the budget, which doesn't match inflation, which means you're shrinking as you're talking about getting bigger. Um, you know, this this is the, the the reality. The Germans can't deliver on what they say they want to deliver on. Um, the, the French are a freaking joke right now, literally just a disaster. Um, Macron faces impeachment or the other outcome is he'll be compelled to resign. Uh, France is, is falling apart on itself. Um, you know, there used to be a debate within the European Union that sort of broke down into what we call the Berlin School and the Parisian School. Uh, this is economic theory. I'm not an economist. Um, but, you know, the Germans have, you know, sort of, you know, traditional banker, conservative um, monetary policies. Um, and the German mark is the heart of the the euro i mean it's the it's 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 the german economy and the strength of the mark that made the transition to the euro possible um you know the french franc less so but it's still a big economy but the french have an important political role to play and they have much more liberal approach and you saw that as you took a look at how europe wanted to deal with for instance the crisis in greece the issues in in poland and southern italy etc um there was this 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 debate taking place, you know, uh, fiscal conservatism, fiscal liberalism. This is before Ukraine. This is, you know, Europe already fracturing into two schools of thought because the euro was running into um, the reality that the concept of a European Union, a, a European singularity is an absurdity. Uh, it just doesn't work, um, especially when you start throwing in, um, you know, political hot potatoes like immigration, uh, you know, that, uh, so Europe is already deeply fractured, not just between Berlin and uh, France, but between old Europe and new Europe, the newly empowered Eastern part of Europe, uh, that after the cold war, you know, uh, became sort of the darlings of, uh, of the West as we expanded NATO in an effort to create a bulwark against Russia to bring Russia down. But now that's running into you know, and now they're inconvenient. Do you really think that the Latvians, Lithuanians, and Estonians are the most popular people in Europe today? These little chihuahuas running around barking, war, 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 war. And Europe's going, no, <laughs> we don't want it. We don't have the means to do this. Poland, you know, is, is you know, the proverbial skinny kid at the beach who got that matchbox, the old Charles Atlas, you know, lift weights and you can be, so he went to the gym and he got a little bit of flex here and he's out there on the beach flexing and uh, thinking he's bigger than he is. Poland's just a pathetically small Central European country that has no meaning, no relevance by itself. There's a reason why Poland gets invaded and people cross over because Poland sucks as a nation. Um, and it will continue. I'm sorry, Poles, but prove me wrong. Elect a government that's, that, that stands for something other than letting the rest of the world back you up while you flex. You pulled that a couple of times, and that's why you got occupied. That's why you got defeated. Okay? You wanted the world to come to your rescue in World War II. 
Not going to happen. Nobody's coming to your rescue because nobody cares about you. You're irrelevant. You're like Ukraine. You know, <laughs> you just don't matter. Um, it could matter if you brought something positive to the mix, uh, contributed in a meaningful fashion. But the moment you start thinking that you're bigger than you are, when you're something you're not, then it becomes problematic. And so the polls will continue to be a huge problem uh, for Europe. You have, you know, Hungary threatening. I mean, who knows where Hungary is going to go? Bulgaria, uh, Romania is going through some problems. Europe is not a stable environment, it's an inherently destabilized entity that's collapsing in on itself as it speaks. Um, you know, that's the reality. So there's, there's the, the, we should stop this nonsense about speaking about, you know, Europe and what Europe's going to do. Europe is going to disappear. Europe doesn't exist. Nation states exist. And each one of these nation states, as Europe collapses, is going to collapse in on itself and try and solve the problem for itself. Do you really think the French political crisis is going to be solved by somebody in Brussels saying, well, we in the European Union believe that France should do the following? France is going to say pound sand. Um, Italy is going to have some big problems coming up. Um, you know, we haven't heard from them in a while, but trust me, those problems are there. The Maloney government may not be long on this planet. Uh, none of these governments are long on this planet because the economic crises that face Europe collectively, not just individual states, but collectively, are almost insurmountable. Um, and at the end of the day, when you're a politician, I think James Carville's uh, 1992 um, you know, maxim to Bill Clinton, it's the economy stupid. It's the economy. It's not Ukraine and Russia and war. It's the economy. Do the people have jobs? Do the people have health insurance? Do the people you know, have a standard of living? And remember, we're not talking about taking people out of the depression and making them better where they've already suffered and they're strong and resilient. We're about taking the softest people in the planet, the Euro spoiled European populations that had you know, big vacations, big pensions, guaranteed everything. Why? Because they could underwrite it with cheap Russian gas. Um, and now they're collapsing. And so their expectations are to stay up here. It's not to start from nothing and go upwards. It's to prevent itself from going downwards. And a politician right now isn't going to be able to deliver on that. So one by one by one by one, you're going to watch successive European governments fail because they can't live up to the expectations of the people they're supposed to serve. Not the European Union, not the European singularity, but the French people, the German people, the Italian people. Europe forgot how to do that because they bought into this nonsense of the European Union. The stupidity of a singularity when one never existed and one will never exist. Um, and that's 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 the reality of Europe. It's again, I, I what I'll say today is that the, the European problem that manifests itself right now, that people are talking about, is going to be a very different problem come January when the next president's sworn in, and a very different problem come next summer. Um, we're talking about rapid um you know, the rapid collapse of, of this European Union, this European promise. Are they, do you see any sign that Europe is learning from the conflict in Ukraine if something happens between the United States and China not to get involved in that sort of conflict because they have been damaged by this conflict? They have been hurting by this conflict in Ukraine too much that they're not can they cannot sustain any sort of new conflict with China because we know how important China is for Europe. I don't think look when you're when you're of course everybody knows China's important for Europe. <laughs> Germany sent successive delegations to China. Um, you know, and again, to show you the stupidity of this whole European concept and their subordination to the United States, we have told Europe that you have to break away from your dependence upon uh, the Chinese, you know, supply chain and uh, things of that nature. Um, we, we, and the Chinese went. So you're uh, you're sanctioning us. You're 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 breaking from us. You're breaking with it. No, no, no. We're and I forget the term. Um, we're um, de-risking. Instead of de-linking, we're de-risking. What that means is reducing the risks that are entailed by too much dependence upon Chinese um, you know, economic change. But Schultz went over there with the head of, I think, VW and maybe some other German automobile bakers. And um, 
you know, Schultz and, and, and his people, you know, Baerbach and others are like, we're going to de-risk. And the Chinese are like, all right, if you insist, I mean, okay, uh, if you want to. And VW turns around and goes, boss, what the hell are you talking about de-risking? Well, we want to strengthen opportunities. He said, you understand that VW as an entity is losing money everywhere in the world. We don't make money anywhere in the world because of your stupid policies, because of the lunacy of what you've done with energy prices. Et cetera. The only place that we make money is China. That's it. And now you want to de-risk? You want me to pull out? If I pull out, VW collapses. And if VW collapses, Germany collapses. And Olaf Scholz went, oh, I guess we can't de-risk. This is the reality. The Europeans need China. They can't function without China because the, the economic interaction with China is oftentimes the only profitable economic activity taking place in Europe. It's not profitable with America. America, your friend, is gouging you with high gas prices. Uh, we don't care. We claim to care, but we don't care. Our guys are making money hand over fist. Uh, you know, the, 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 the stakeholders, you know, the shareholders are like, hey, great, we're making lots of money. And nobody cares about Europe. Again, I come back to America's a friend of nobody. America's a friend only to itself. And even then, we're not necessarily, um, you know, friendly to ourselves because if you're Republican, you hate a Democrat, Democrat, you hate a Republican, et cetera. But th this is, I mean, you know, of course, we're oversimplifying this problem, but I'm talking about trends. The trend is Europe can't live without China. China can definitely live without Europe. Um, and so, and, and that's that's why people have to understand the importance of what's happening with BRICS. If BRICS ever solidifies as this as a, as a G7 equivalent uh, in the global South, uh, what you have is a self-sustaining economic universe that Europe and America don't play a part of. And therefore we've become irrelevant. And then we get to trade with one another, but not, you know, there's so much economic potential in the Eurasian landmass. Um, if India and China and Russia ever fully start cooperating, that right there is game, set, match. And you know, if BRICS happens in uh, in Kazan, the big three will be sitting at the same table. Vladimir Putin, Modi, Xi Jinping. Boom! They own the world. <laughs> they're the controllers. They're the masters of the universe. Well, they're not the master of America. America doesn't matter anymore. America doesn't matter. We've made ourselves irrelevant. We can't afford. I mean, we just sent, you know, all these aircraft carriers and ships off to the uh, to the uh, Persian Gulf to, you know, influence the region. We can't afford that, by the way. <laughs> it wasn't budgeted. Uh, so we have to steal money from the rest of the military to pay for that. You know, that's all right. That's what we'll do. But meanwhile, we're decommissioning 17 ships in the Navy because we can't find sailors to man them. Nobody's joining. Nobody's joining the army. We already had to shrink the army. Marine Corps is doing okay because, you know, the few, the proud and the propaganda machine works and people uh, go to the Marine Corps, but you know, the air force is shrinking. Everything's shrinking. Why? Nobody wants to be part of this military machine anymore. People are looking around the world saying, no, it's forever war overseas doing other people's business. We want to be home making money, you know, living the good life. Uh, living the dream, um, you know, and that's the reality is that we are positioning ourselves for, you know, potential conflict around the world, but we're going to need others to be our proxies. Australia, I mean, the Australians are really the dumbest people on the planet. Um, why would you enter into a relationship with the United States that allowed your nation to be turned into an American aircraft carrier? Um, which all that means is that China is going to sink you with nuclear weapons if there's ever a war. Um, why would you do that? Um, you know, allow the United States, you know, we, we now have 2,400 Marines there. We're talking about permanently stationed 16,000 Marines. We're talking about bringing in brigades of U.S. Army uh, to do what? A, a resumption of the island campaign of World War II to drive the Chinese out of the South Pacific, out of the South China Sea. Um, why would the Philippines embark on this operation with America, because let me tell you what happens when America, when a push comes to shove, America will not be there for you. We're going to get you into a bind, whether your name is Australia or the Philippines, and then we're going to run. We're going to fall back and you're going to be left holding the bag, paying the price. 
checks on the table. We're gone with our credit card and you've got to pay the price. This is what's going to happen. Instead of relying upon diplomacy and, and talking and working things out in an equitable fashion, the United States only knows one thing, military intervention, military intervention. We only have one tool, weapons, weapons. So we flood weapons to Australia. We flood weapons to Philippines. Um, and then it leads to a conflict that we can't sustain. There's all this talk about Taiwan. Let's just be clear. The United States cannot fight a war in Taiwan. Cannot do it. <laughs> there said it, um, which means that if we are going to engage with the Chinese decisively over Taiwan, um, we either accept the inevitability of a humiliating defeat or we go nuclear. And now there will probably something that you, I don't know if you're going to bring it up, but um, you see, we've provoked the Chinese uh, because what we've said is if it goes nuclear, of course, we got, you know, 1,400 some odd uh, nuclear weapons deployed. We're ready to use them at any time. We have range of options. Uh, our nuclear employment plan gives us the ability to go low, high, heavy. Uh, we could even preempt China right now and take out their 400 nukes, and that's not a problem. The Chinese went, oh, yeah, you're right. So we're going to build 360 missile silos, uh, and we're not going to put all of the DF-41s in there, but let's say we put 100 in there. So you don't know which ones they're in. We, they're all over China, but each DF-41 is going to have 10 nuclear warheads capable of delivered 10,000 miles to anywhere in the United States. We build 100 of these missiles. That's 1,000 warheads, dingbat. Now you want to play nuclear war with us? You want to do that, America? And Biden just woke up, signed a new nuclear employment plan that has to factor this in, which doesn't make the world safer. It makes the world more dangerous. Where's arms control of all this? Nobody's talking about arms control. So we are in an arms race with China right now. The last nuclear a treaty with Russia expires in February 26, and then we will enter into a new arms race there. Ladies and gentlemen, save up your money and go on vacation this summer. Maybe you might get one in next summer, but that's it. Then you're going to die. That's the direction we're headed. Uh, you know, this is the reality. A nuclear arms race in a world where the American empire is not the force of stability, but rather the force of instability, that as we collapse, we create more and more crises because we are the military industrial complex. The only way our economy continues to thrive is by making sure defense industry get being fed contract after contract with those contracts require conflict. And so we promote conflict, conflict, contract, contract, money, money, nuclear war, we all die. That's where we're headed right now. New York Times reported that Jake Sullivan is gonna be in China trying to convince, can you hear me? Yeah. New York Times reported that Jake Sullivan going to be in China trying to convince Chinese again not to help Russia. And do you think that he's going to put a new kind of pressure on Chinese? I don't know what he's going to do. But so far, we haven't seen that China going to agree with the United States on putting pressure on not helping Russia. Why he, is he thinking that this time he's, he, he's able to change the mind of Chinese. Well, let's just think about this logically. It's September, or it's almost September. The election will be in November. A new president will be sworn in in January. No matter who wins the election, Jake Sullivan's out of government. Do you think the Chinese give a rat's ass about anything Jake Sullivan's about to say? You think the Chinese are going, oh, let's lean in hard here. Jake Sullivan's coming. I mean, my God, we're going to have to deal with this guy for another four years. No, he's done. Literally the definition of a, a lame duck. Um, I think right now he has to go through the motions because the world is expecting this. Um you know, the United States has to be seen as doing something, promoting something. Um, but China's not going to, you know, change its policies. What does the United States have to offer China? China is with BRICS. That's the direction, multipolarity. I mean, would, would, is, is, is the United States going to say, hey, uh, if you dump Russia, we'll join BRICS? No. <laughs> you know, hey, if you dump Russia, we'll dissolve the G7. No. Hey, if you dump BRICS or dump Russia, uh, we'll give up on Taiwan. Huh. China might listen to that one. But 
Sullivan's not going to put that on the table. Um, I mean, this is stupidity. What is Jake Sullivan going to bring to the table? Not a damn thing. Let's go back to the start of the Biden administration, a meeting uh, that took place between Sullivan, Blinken, and their Chinese counterparts, where the, where the United States started off by trying to lecture the Chinese, and they were shut down immediately. And the Chinese said, this ain't your daddy's China-U.S. relationship. This is a new one. We are not inferior to you. In many ways, we are superior to you, and we will never again be lectured by you about anything. And that's the reality. So, is, you know, what's Jake Sullivan going to do? Go over there with what? First of all, he's the national security advisor. Okay. He's not a policymaker. He's a policy implementer. Um, so normally, if the national security advisor is going to take a lead, that means that there's been an interagency decision. But there's never an interagency decision made in a in a news vacuum, uh, you know, because everybody wants to pick up the phone and you know be the person that was responsible for the headline story. So this is an act of desperation. This is a literal act of desperation by Jake Sullivan. It's going to go nowhere. Yeah. Just to wrap up this session, Scott, when we talk about BRICS, right now we know Azerbaijan and Palestine are asking to be part of BRICS. And how BRICS can help Palestine, in your opinion, if Azerbaijan gets finally gets in into this organization and how BRICS can put pressure on Azerbaijan. We know that Azerbaijan is so important in providing oil to Israel. And is that possible that through Azerbaijan, BRICS just put some sort of pressure on Israel? Is that possible? Or Well, I, I, think, I think you missed the whole purpose of BRICS. Because what you're describing is what the United States does and its allies. And BRICS has said, that's not us. We're a consensus organization. We don't put pressure on anybody. We come up with a with a, a decision that people buy into. We have discussions. But what what BRICS is going to now sanction Azerbaijan? Hey, join our organization so we can sanction you. No, that's not how it works. Uh, what happens is Azerbaijan comes in and people say, "Hey, Gaza is a problem." Everybody goes, "Yep, Gaza is a problem. We need to come up with a solution." Yep. How do we work together to get this solution done? Um, you know, and then, then then they work out of that. But we really need to stop thinking like America thinks. Um, BRICS will not be a sanctioning body. They're not going to sanction. BRICS will be a body that promises growth, not war. Um, and, uh, you know, promises, you know, cohesion and unity, not, you know, separation and isolation. Um, what can pal Palestine expect from this one, if they're part of BRICS in, in one way or another, um, the economic potential of BRICS to help rebuild Palestine. I think that's a very big, a very big thing. Um, and, and, you know, that's where China comes into play. That's where all of uh, the BRICS nations comes into play. But the idea that um, that Azerbaijan is being lured into BRICS so that Russia and China can put pressure on it, that's American thinking. That's not how BRICS operates. BRICS is a consensus-driven organization that will not, it's just not going to, that, that's how America defeated itself. I mean, my God, if we hadn't sanctioned the world, we'd still be the most influential economic power in the world today where people actually look to us and say, oh, you know, a relationship with America is economically beneficial. Now people are fearful. We have an economic relation with America, but we don't have independent foreign policy anymore because if we ever do something we think is good for us, America will sanction us. And so, so therefore, it's not good to be closely tied to America. It's not good to be dependent upon the dollar. This is why there's a drive for de-dollarization, alternative forms of uh, international uh, payment. The United States has destroyed itself through this tool of sanctioning. Why would BRICS ever follow that uh, pattern of behavior? 